Now I want to conclude my discussion of uh, the Islamic conception of the human state and man by saying specifically a few words about uh, the relationship between the male and the female and especially the role of femininity in Sufism. Uh, we now fortunately have an excellent book in the English language, the book The Tao of Islam by Sachiko Murata which uh, discusses very extensively this relationship from the highest level in the divine nature itself to the human relation of male and female and those of you who are interested in this I suggest you read this book it has a lot of translations of texts which are not available anywhere else in both Arabic and Persian uh, on a more uh, limited and uh, brief scale uh, there is a very good article by uh, Malay scholar Zelan Morris in the Islamic Quarterly published about five years ago on the significance of femininity in Sufism uh, in case especially some of the female students might be interested in reading your paper that's an excellent paper uh, summary and I've written something on that also uh, on the relation between male and female in my book Traditional Islam in the Modern World there's now a certain amount of literature on this subject that is gradually growing up uh, and it's very, very far from the usual images of uh, women in Islam and how they're downtrodden and so forth and so on, that, uh, uh, which we all know about and into which I will not go, which of course is utter nonsense, uh, but I will not get into that discussion now. Coming back to the Sufi conception of the male and female, uh, the first important point is to realize that the fi male-female distinction is not simply a biological accident uh, as is made out today. <coughs> it's not an accident, it's not a secondary matter, it's a very profound element of the human state. And that it goes back from the biological to the psychological to the spiritual to the divine reality itself. That is the root of uh, the duality between male and female and therefore the master and the feminine is to be found in the divine nature itself. You might say, what do we mean by that? Uh, the divine essence, of course, transcends all duality because it's beyond all relationality, beyond all relation. And therefore, you cannot talk about the divine essence being uh, male or female, it's beyond that. However, even in the, on the level of divine nature, you can find the roots of the male and the female. On the highest level, God is at once absolute and infinite. These are the two supreme uh, attributes of the divine. And these two correspond to the male and the female. That is the principle, the supreme archetype of the male and the female. Now it's very important to understand here that the male is not simply equivalent to uh, the human male and the female principle to the human female because we all contain within ourselves both the male and the female elements. It's more complicated than that. <coughs> brought out more beautifully in the Chinese tradition than anywhere else, the complementarity of yin-yang, the two principles of, of which you all know about, or most of you know about. Uh, anyway, the divine absoluteness, mm -hmm. God is absolute, is the principle of masculinity. Mm -hmm. And God is infinite, is the principle of femininity. Also, the divine has manifested itself in the Qur'an, that is, God has revealed himself in the Qur'an, uh, in those uh, names which we went over already in the class, which are divided into the names of rigor and of mercy, or the names of majesty and beauty. Remember, I put that on the board for you before.
which when added together give you perfection. All good things in Arabic conveniently rhyme together. Kamal. So you have Jalal, Jamal, and Kamal. <coughs> but uh, but uh, the adding together is just for your further information. Right now I'm going to concentrate on uh, Jalal and Jamal. All names of God are either names of Jalal, Asma'ul Jalal, or names of beauty, Asma'ul Jamal. And we went over that, such names as uh, generosity, forgiveness, mercy, are names of beauty. Such names as he who takes count of things, the just, and so forth, are names of rigor or of majesty. Now, on the level of the divine names, therefore you have again the reassertion of the principle of masculinity and femininity. That is, the names of majesty uh, and the al-Jalal itself, the divine majesty, is the prototype of masculinity. And the divine beauty is the prototype of femininity. As for how we envisage God, you know, all this uh, new uh, uh, feminist theology is going around trying to change the gender of God in English, which no longer uh, refer to God as He and so forth, and God knows what's finally going to do to Christianity because Christ Himself said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is a Lord's Prayer uttered by Christ. And it could be funny, and I would say, our mother who art in earth, hallowed be thy name, or something like that. That's what these extreme eco-feminists uh, are saying now. Uh, but I think Christianity will finally resist it, because it's really taught them to misunderstand what is going on, and the loss of a certain dimension of mystical theology has brought about all these errors. But anyway, in the Islamic world, Islam is seen to be a very patriarchal religion. It's always said to be a very patriarchal religion. Theologically, the feminine element is so much present that this has never been uh, a problem, especially in Sufism. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the world, that is God as creator, God is He, that is uh, representing the aspect of uh, action, of force, of movement, of creation, of rigor also, the laws that the world has come from God as the lawgiver, a shara. Uh, but the uncreating aspect of God, because God is not exhausted by his creative powers. God is more than the creator of the world. That's why the name Al-Khaliq, creator, is only one of the names of God. The divine reality, you might say, did not completely participate in the act of creation, because God is infinite. And the world is finite, its creation is finite. So there are aspects of God which are non-creating. And in Arabic it would be very simple. The other names of God are not Al-Khaliq. Creator is only one of the names of God. The non-creating aspect of God corresponds to divine femininity. And is this to which Sufi poetry so often refers to in the feminine. All of his images of the beautiful beloved in Sufi poetry are referring to the metacosmic reality of the divine, not the creating aspect of the divine. And that's why Ibn Arabi uh, says that uh, God can be referred to as both Hua and Hia, as both He and She. It might appear start startling, I said to. Western students of Islam who think Islam is so patriarchal and they're having trouble with Christianity, changing God's gender and so forth, that this is a non-problem in the Islamic world because there's a complete metaphysics which has a place in it for both uh, realities. Uh, furthermore, some of the key terms which are associated with the divine when you speak in Arabic are in the feminine form. 
And, and three of those are absolutely essential in order to understand the feminine dimension in Sufism. One is wisdom itself. God is Al-Hakim, which can mean both also giving hope, that is, ruler, but also as wise, he who uh, is, is wise. But wisdom itself, wisdom itself in Arabic is in the feminine form. This is feminine in Arabic. And if you wanted to make an Arabic a sentence saying wisdom is something precious, and uh, in Arabic, in such a sentence, you would not have to repeat the, the pronoun, but if you could, you would say al-hakma hiya thamina, or something like that. You would use she, as you do in regular Arabic sentence. <coughs> and this, of course, has resonances vis-a-vis -vis the Christian tradition, unfortunately forgotten. And that is that in mystical Christianity, Sophia, divine wisdom, appeared in the feminine uh, form. The divine Sophia. And that's why it was also associated with the Virgin Mary in the Middle Ages in certain Christian mystical schools. The Virgin was also considered to be divine wisdom, Sophia. The second is this most important name of God after Allah, <coughs> Ar-Rahman, which is related to the word Ar-Rahman, which means mercy. God is merciful. And this word is also related to the roots, in fact, comes from the roots related to the word uh, rahim, which means womb in Arabic. The source of life. So the source of life is the divine mercy. And the feminine element of it is very, very evident. So the mercy of God is the feminine aspect of the divinity. And in Arabic it serves a feminine word, rahman. The third, which is most remarkable of all, is the word for the divine essence itself, and that is also feminine. And that, which is the essence of God itself. So you might say that uh, on this metaphysical plane, uh, femininity corresponds to interiority, and masculinity to manifestation to manifestation. Not that they're equivalent to exoteric and esoteric, but there are correspondences. Uh, in fact, uh, from the point of Islam, the whole of the Islamic tradition, the hiding of the female beauty, the veil and the covering of her body in public, has everything to do with interiority, with inwardness. It's also reflected in Islamic architecture. In a traditional Islamic city, the beauty is interiorized, it's inward. When you walk in the streets of a traditional city, outward you don't see very much. As soon as you enter into houses, you see these beautiful courtyards, tile, fountains, and gardens, and so forth and so on. Uh, all of these go together. It has to do with the element of inwardness, interiority. Now, uh, according to uh, the Islamic anthropology, all human beings contain both of these elements within themselves. There's no doubt about it. And there's within every human being also, uh, for example, the soul, which is always feminine vis-a-vis -vis the spirit, which is masculine within us. And you, you had that also in Christian mysticism, the wedding of the soul and the spirit like the queen and the king in alchemy, the gold and the silver. All of these, these are universal symbols. Uh, so within the soul of both men and women, there are both masculine and feminine elements, but also the whole of the, of the being, including the body, uh, and the psychic elements, everything else, there are both elements present. Now, uh, Sufism, on the basis of, of course, the teachings of Islam, which are very, very clear on this, uh, sees the perfection of the human state, that is reaching the state of universal man, in not reaching a least common denominator between the male and the female sexes, 
but in fact in emphasizing the particular genius and character of each sex. That is, Islamic civilization has always tried to create a masculine form which is very masculine, very virile, and a feminine form which is very feminine. And therefore one must not make a mistake between the androgenic reality of the universal man and a kind of common denominator asexuality or bisexuality or something like that. This has gone to such an extent that according to the Prophet of Islam, one of the signs of the end of the world is when men will look like women and women will look like men. God help us. And this is a very famous hadith. Uh, I always say joking, we say this unisex barber shops, it is a very bad sign of, <laughs> of the times. Uh, so you have actually, within Islamic society itself, always the emphasis upon this, that is, the spiritual work, a person is qualified to follow the spiritual path, the path of Sufism. The certain virtues which are common for both men and women, which they must cultivate. They must be truthful, honest, loving, and so forth and so on. There are rights which are for everybody. All of the Sufi rights, like the Islamic rights, are for male and female. There are no special rights for men. Prayers, invocations, litanies, awrad, singing, all of the different things we're going to get to in a moment. They're for everybody. But the development of the being upon the spiritual path should always be in this way, that in the female there should always be the emphasis upon the, upon the female element. Because the female element should not be sacrificed in order for women to become men-like. Now, in this perspective, uh, Sufism and Islam is very different from, let's say, Buddhism, in which to reach Nirvana, according to Theravada Buddhism, a person must first be born into the male state. A female cannot reach Nirvana. Now they're trying to change things, uh, but I mean, I'm talking about traditional classical Buddhism. In Sufism, this is not the case. And it has manifested itself in this way that the great saints, female saints of Islam, the great Sufi saints, throughout history, even when they were 90 years old, were known for the great feminine beauty. And the men for the virility and masculinity, not in the sense of being unforgiving or ungenerous, uh, because a real, a real masculinity means to be hard with oneself and generous, generous with the world, not generous with oneself and hard with the world. It has nothing to do with this macho attitude we talk about in modern society. I mean, t traditionally understood, that's what really manliness means. Ma uh, in Islam, it's always connected with, with nobility and generosity. And being hard with oneself. There's so many proverbs in Arabic, some which are even impolite to translate in, in a class, what makes a man. Uh, it means precisely to have discipline over oneself before anything else. Now, discipline is also there for the female, there's no doubt about it. But the types as they have developed in, in Islam, if you want to understand what the really Sufism is, the male type, I mean, you have in your mind someone like, let's say, Amir Abdul Qadir or someone like that, that was a kind of warrior saint, and even those who were not warriors, who were scholars or in, uh, musicians, something like that, over oh, this element of virility, of presence, of masculinity, and the female type were always of great femininity. Uh, this phenomenon, of course, probably nobody in this class has uh, observed it. But I've observed it in my life several times. And the most stunning example of it was one of the greatest, really, female Sufis of the century in the Islamic world, Sayyid of Fatma Yashrutiya. The famous uh, Yashruti Sheikh, uh, which was also a spiritual teacher, whose father was the founder of the Yashrutiya order. And she was born when he was 90 years old. When I knew her, she was the only person I knew whose father was born in the 18th century. Uh, and uh, uh, she was a really remarkable being, a really remarkable being. They had their original Sufi center in Akka in Palestine. After partition, they moved to Lebanon. And when I knew her in the 1960s, she was in her late 80s. And when you saw her, I mean, if I can speak for a moment as an ordinary man, uh, she, it was like seeing a 20-year beautiful woman. She was unbelievably attractive. As a woman, it was really um, impossible to understand the kind of aura around her face, and she looks so young and so beautiful. This is, has something to do with the prototype of femininity in a sense that was manifested in her. And we have these stories of Ibn Arabi, the great Andalusian sheikh who wrote about the, his life in Andalusia. 
among the many teachers he had, two of them were women. Two of them were Spanish women of very high accomplishment. And he writes about both of them were in their 80s and 90s. And he says the same thing. He said, when I saw Fatima Marshena, she was about 90 years old. Well, the first time I met her, she was like a 16-year-old beautiful woman. When I first met her, it was unbelievable that she was so old. So this idea of the male and the female, uh, it must not be understood that you become spiritual by transcending these minor accidental differences. It's much more profound than that. It's part of God's creation. And the Quran says, verily, we created you in pairs, as wajan. That is, from the very act of creation, the fiat looks, God created things in pair. And therefore, great respect for femininity and great respect for masculinity, both must be there. If one sex devours the other, something is lost of creation itself. Or if they become reduced to a least common denominator, they begin to be just like each other, according to the Islamic perspective, something is lost. It's as if a tiger and a horse were to look just like each other. Uh, each of them has a perfection in its own way. Remarkable creatures in their own way, but they're different. Now, a step further, of course, is uh, to see how this difference acts out in the spiritual life. And here we have a very interesting and complicated situation that is really universal. It cuts across, of course, all religions because it has to do with the human state. And that is that, from one point of view, the male and female complement each other. There's no doubt about that. That is also the origin of the sexual attraction between the two sexes. They complement each other. And there are all these religious stories in the Bible and the Quran uh, that God created uh, the two for to be companions of each other, all kinds of things like that. Uh, so there is a mutual attraction. But also each human being, whether male or female, by virtue of being human, is also complete unto itself. That is a direct reflection of the androgenic being. And here comes then rivalry and repulsion. And that is why all relation between the sexes is dominated by two forces, of both attraction and repulsion. I mean, the most wonderful love between the two sexes, the most wonderful marriage, there are moments when the man wants to be alone, when the woman wants to be alone. Uh, the, each needs its own, what they call now, space. They need their own space. Now, of course, there are other things. They have to find themselves again. and, uh, and uh, They live in a very strange world, but even before, people have to find themselves. And they each needs its own space. And the, the reason for that is that you have this double relationship. You have the androgenic reality, which corresponds to Ansan al Kamel, which contains all the possibilities of the human state. And that androgenic reality, that Ansan al Kamel, is the prototype of both the male and the female. So each, as I said, is in a sense complete unto itself. At the same time, that's not so as only half the story, the two complement each other. That's why in all cosmogenesis, that is the stories of the creation of the world, the male and the female are separated from a single being. You must remember that despite all the criticism that are being made against the core book of Genesis, Adam, the word Adam in Hebrew, does not only mean the male, it means the whole human state. So when Eve was separated as the rib of Adam, it doesn't mean that there was a man standing there in the sense of a male, and then the female was separated from it. It means that the original Adam, which comprised both of, of the sexes, the female sex was separated from it. And uh, that is why also, of course, uh, it's quite obvious, both psychologically and biologically, not to talk about socially, the two sexes attract. That is, they find a completion of their being in the other. And that is also why the only experience of unity that is open to most human beings is sexual orgasm or se sexual pleasure. Uh, that's why it's the most powerful of all bodily pleasures, because it is the only possibility of direct experience of union. Uh, and that is why in certain religions, the truly spiritual beings do not have need that possibility, where you have monasticism, like in Christianity or Buddhism, but that union is made possible vertically. Yes? What is it about the Genesis story, and also the people in the Quran, that gives that in a male character, that it's just a story to be told in order, a symbol that is, like what happened in the beginning? 
why is Adam usually seen on the literal level as being male? The symbolism of the male, although we know he was taken from them. Psychically, that in the soul, why is why one always identified him as being male? If indeed he wasn't, he being not male and female. Well, that's no, that's uh, there are a lot of uh, Kabbalistic and uh, commentaries upon the Torah which make this very clear. But on the ordinary human level, the reason is the following. Uh, if I can not defend the, the book of Genesis uh, uh, for those who attack it, that uh, on, the, on this worldly level, the level of this world, the male is like a center for the female. The female is like the space for the male. And even in a good marriage, that's what happens. That is, the man provides a center for the woman's psychological life. And the female provides a space, a living space for the male. And in that sense, uh, like a circle, where you have first of all center and then you draw the circumference, uh, that's, that's what it really means. Uh, and in this world, uh, the male has, has a certain primacy because of its size, of the size of its brain, of its power, and so forth and so on. And uh, the female, in a sense, is a more interiorized being. And then you have this other element, of course, that precisely because of this, uh, the female, in the female, there are two possibilities of both, in the, when we talk about the book of Genesis in the Christian and Jewish tradition, especially in the Christian tradition, there's the possibility of Eve as seductress, and the possibility of Mary as redemptress. That is, for the male nature, the female can always be seductive, dissipated, at the same time that uh, she can become the source of recollection, return back to God. Now, of course you might say that for the female nature also the male can be seducting, seducing. That's, there's no doubt about that. But uh, the way traditional societies work, based on the primacy biological impulses, it is usually the male that goes after the female uh, at ordinary biology. Because of that, the female was protected from the male always. The whole structure of society was to protect the female from the male, including the question of marriage, which is so much emphasized by religion, which is uh, mostly, not completely, of course, may have bad marriage both ways, to the benefit of the female and to the detriment of the male in many ways. If you're just nothing but animals that have evolved in most animal species, I mean a lion or a tiger or something like that, the male lion uh, procreates and then goes his own way and the female lion raises the cubs. Uh, so the institution of marriage in, any way, in many ways was a way of, of protecting the women from the biological urges of the male. And because of all of these, the story presents itself like that. But it does not mean at all uh, trivialization of the female role by any means and uh, the most important thing which I do not want to get into now because it's a very vast subject is that as long as the possibility of spiritual interiorization and having a spiritual meaning in female existence was strong and men had to follow the religious duties of providing for the women and providing for the home the sense of need to be equal to men was very weak. That's why it didn't manifest itself 5,000 years ago. I mean, it's not, you cannot say that all the women throughout history were just idiots, they didn't know what they were doing until 1980, and then they suddenly arrived. And the fact that today you have a large number of women in other societies who should be unhappy according to the standards of Mrs. Abzug or someone like that, but who are not, they're happy. You know, you don't know what goes on, a lot of these people come from America to India, say, why are you happy? You should be the most unhappy person in the world. Uh, you're not supposed to be happy because that other dimension is not seen so much this interiorizing inward dimension which the traditional religions try to inculcate and that's why the myths and the scriptures usually speak in this language yes you mentioned of the monks as working towards that androgynous that if that's the correct the androgynous level which you also refer to as the insana kama yes it seems I'm, I'm a little bit confused about how an emphasis in Islam there is such an emphasis on um, marriage as being such a spiritual duty as well as a materialist duty, and yet <coughs> it would seem from your statement of, of the monks that they are closer to the transcendence into the universal man. I didn't say that at all. It was You're just reading that into that. No, uh, I did, never said that they were closer. 
I said, that's another possibility. Okay, well, it was just the, the reference to the insan of Hanu and reference. Well, I, I'm just using the Islamic term. That is, spiritual perfection. Uh, uh, Islam does not accept Ruhmadiyya, that is, monasticism, and sees marriage in a very positive light, to the extent that the Prophet said that marriage is half a religion. Ad nikah niswuddin. And somebody said the other half is patience because there's another hadith according to which as sabr niswuddin. That really teaches you patience. Uh, that's one uh, way of looking at it. Judaism is also like Islam. That is, it tries to realize perfection on the basis of the establishment of a horizontal human equilibrium, which is based on the model of the Prophet. The other possibility is based on the model of Christ, who did not marry, who did not beget children, and who did not enter into the life of the world, didn't care about politics, about economics, except once when he kicked out the money lenders out of the temple. But who said, my kingdom is not of this world. And that represents another kind of spiritual possibility of trying to reach spiritual perfection, which in Sufism would be called al insan or Kamal, of course, by divesting oneself of the world, and especially of sexuality, which is so much emphasized, not only in Christianity, but also in Buddhism and, and in Hindu monasticism. I mean, yeah. we're yes. being aware of the other religions, but so there is or the no. equivalence of path, but Islam only allows for the, 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 the unified path of the masculine and the feminine. That's right. Emphas Islam emphasizes that, yes. But I'm saying that although this is, in a sense, the completion of the human state by realizing this possibility, it is not the only possibility precisely because each human being is also a reflection of the androgenic figure. Does one arise out of the other. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the story of Gandhi being married and yet after going through the stages of the union of masculine and feminine, then moving towards the androgynous of divesting oneself of this physical... Not at all. Not at all. It depends on one's vocation. Because the reverse of Gandhi's life is the life of the most universal and famous saint of Islam, Abdul Qadir Jilani, who was a celibate until he was 51 years old. 51. At the age of 51, he got married. And by the time he got, died in his 80s, he had 35 children, <laughs> all of whom became great saints. <coughs> so you have, uh, this is, uh, these are not uh, norms uh, that depends on the vocation of a person. And one cannot say that in Islam, the other is rare. <coughs> that is, celibacy is rare. But it's not totally unknown. In the history of Sufism, we have Sufis who were married, but who ne never had a conjugal life. For ascetic reasons, they simply pr practice asceticism. But since Islam sees sexuality in its positive aspect, not only as uh, the act for procreation, but the act for completion and transformation, and understands the psychological transforming powers, that's uh, rare. And Islamic society puts a great deal of pressure on people to get married. You have to be a hero in the Islamic world to remain celibate. I mean, <laughs> you'll never get fed by your mother, your aunt will never invite you. <laughs> yes? Um, also, I guess it's different than Really That's right. Well. Yes, it does. Very much um, so, yes. The question that I wanted to um, ask has, again, going back to Adam as the uh, human being. But that, doesn't that imply that Adam is himself, itself, androgynous? Because uh, there are two Adams. Because separated from it, leaving the male. That's right. There are two Adams. So one doesn't separate the, the, then the <coughs> female can't be, you can't get a male out of the female. I mean, it's, it's Adam that's being... Oh, it's very, very clear. There are two Adams. There is Adam before the separation of Eve from Adam, and that's the androgenic Adam. And then once Eve is separated from the androgenic being, then you have Adam and Eve as the father and mother of humanity, you might say. But the point that I was getting at is it does leave the male as ontologically anterior to the female, and isn't that the basis of the male, the primacy of the male, of the female of the no, first of all, it doesn't mean ontologically, but... Morris, for example, has said that that's the best event her article, but that's not correct. Well, I would not say that is, uh, you see, in Islam, this statement that... Female is derivative of the male, ontologically. No, that female is not derivative of the male. No, Zella Morris said it's a mistake. She would be supposed to be superior because it comes first. The male comes first because the cosmogonic act itself, even before the androgyne was broken in two, corresponds to the, uh, might say, masculine male element of the divine reality. 
I said uh, the creative, <coughs> the creative act is like biologically also the same way. Uh, so that in a sense, uh, somebody once said uh, very beautifully, he says in the Islamic perspective, you have three relations. Men are superior to women, women are superior to men, and they're equal. All three exist and under, under different aspects. They're equal before God and before the laws of Islam. That is the great opportunities of life, the question of heaven and hell, and happiness and sorrow, and felicity and punishment. Uh, before those laws, and before all the laws in Islamic society, male and female are equal. That's why equality. That doesn't mean that in society they do the same thing. That's quite something else. Their, their function is seen as being complementary to each other, not equal to each other. But before the law, before the Sharia and before God, the male is superior to the female from one point of view, precisely cosmologically. Uh, and that is because the male corresponds to the divine quality of uh, masculinity. Creativity. And the female is superior to the male precisely by the fact that she corresponds to the beyond being, to God beyond even the act of, of creating. Pardon me? To add that. Yes, yes. So these are very, very complicated relations. And for this class, I do not expect you to exhaust all of these, but I could not have given a discussion of the universal man without having said something of this. Now, the reason, uh, uh, the consequence of this is that when you read Islamic literature, different kinds of Islamic literature, uh, it's in the literature of Sufism where you have the greatest discussion of femininity. <coughs> and it is really Sufi stories which transformed even ordinary love stories in both Arabic and Persian literature to the sublimest levels. I mean, the greatest love stories of ordinary Islamic people, they don't have to be Sufis, are associated with figures who have either been drawn from Sufi literature or which Sufi literature had itself transformed from ordinary love stories to the highest level of meaning. Example, uh, the love story of Layla and Majnun, or Layli and Majnun in Persia, uh, which is perhaps the most famous of all Arabic love stories. In Persian, this word exists both in, as Layla and as Layli. Uh, when Islam came around, uh, this was a kind of simple story in Arabia of a person called Majnun who had very intense love for the daughter of another tribe, a woman called Layli. Layla. But this was taken and elaborated in Sufi literature. Uh, and some of the greatest masterpieces of literature, especially the Layli and Majnun of Nizami, the Persian poet Nizami, which is one of the peaks of world literature, really.